The question is, is America, is ours a just society? And there's a lot of things that have brought up, um, a lot of uh, reasons to wonder whether this is a just society. For one, we've had successful candidacies of Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump railing against sort of the rigged system. And two, if I can just, uh, guys, uh, any conversations can happen in the hallway out there. We're gonna, this panel actually is gonna be quick, so we need to start it right away, thank you. And number two, there's a rise of a new movement, um, social justice movement. So I'm gonna start by asking Robert Doerr, who's my, my other boss at the American Enterprise Institute, where I'm a fellow, I'm gonna start by asking you the, the topic question. Is ours a, a just society? Uh, absolutely, and it's kind of a, it's almost so obvious. Um, the opportunities in the United States are great and many. I've spent my career before I came to AI working in programs targeted at the lowest income Americans. But even there, I found that if people recognize their own personal agency and their own personal potential and dignity as a human, that there were opportunities for employment, for upward mobility. Um, and I think one of the most uh, unpleasant and dangerous messages, and it comes from both sides, is this perception that the world is, is, is against everyone and that everyone's a victim and that they can't get ahead. Because when young people begin to believe that, whether they hear it from uh, far right conservatives or far left liberals, um, they lose hope and they lose uh, an important part of their social capital that they need in order to take advantage of the great opportunities we have in the country. We still are the country where people all over the world want to come to because this is where they think they'll have the best chance to move up. Larry, your take. You know, you hear this whole idea of social justice warriors and there's not a fair and equitable justice system in America. And my initial reaction is, well, you're crazy. Of course, we have the greatest justice system in the world. However, let's think about this for a minute. You know what injustice is? Injustice is a sailor on a submarine getting sent to jail for taking a picture on a cell phone and Hillary Clinton being able to keep all of her emails as Secretary of State on a server. We look at that and we think, oh, there's two sets of rules. Justice is uh, people who are crossing our border illegally, staying in our country illegally, getting federal benefits and going to getting local benefits that we're paying for, while people who are trying to come to this country legally have to wait for years to try to get in and do things the right way. And we've got local governments who are setting up sanctuary cities and counties so that they can protect these people who have broken our laws and continue to break our laws. We look at that and we say, well, that's not justice either. There actually is quite a bit of injustice. When you go to Los Angeles or San Francisco and you see people who are allowed to live on the streets, it's against the law to live on the street. It's against the law to camp on the street. It's a law against the law, forgive me, to defecate and urinate on the streets. It's against the law to shoot up drugs on the streets. But you go to Los Angeles and the police literally walk past all of that behavior, we pay taxes, we follow the law, we look at that and we see injustice. So actually, I think we do have a problem in this country, but it's not what the leftists marching on college campuses are screaming about. I think it's us, regular law-abiding Americans who look at what's going on and say, why do we have two sets of rules and why aren't we enforcing the law that is written the way it is written? I think, I think that's great. We've got a lot of issues already on the table. We've got economics, we've got immigration, we've got defecation, so we're touching on all the issues. But all before, the shuns. before you, and, and Tiana, I want you to touch on all, as many of those as you'd like in a minute, but I want to start um, something you've covered for us. Um, the term SJW has become a term that conservatives use to make fun of people who might brown, brand themselves social justice warriors. But we use that term because this is something that a lot of people are taking up this, uh, this mantle. What, what is it, does it work? Does it make us a more just society? So it goes without saying that, that this is the freest and most just society in human history. But in, a, in, a, in an attempt to overcorrect the injustices of the past, social justice has been born. And social justice is close to just socialized justice. So for instance, when we saw those videos of the Covington Catholic kids, us on the right, we saw a boy standing there, maybe smiling while, you know, he's being screamed at. 
to a social justice warrior, they see a white boy, an avatar for whatever legacy of white racism existed in the past by minorities who have historically been oppressed. There's no question that slavery, is, that slavery and our treatment of Native Americans was an original sin. But in that instance, Nick Sandman did nothing wrong, and yet he was vilified by a social justice left. The world was sort of introduced to this with O.J. Simpson. You know, two years prior to the whole O.J. trial, uh, LAPD beat up Rodney King, a black man. And that was a grave injustice. Two years later, a predominantly black jury got their revenge by exonerating a guilty black man. That grand irony being that O.J. would always say, I'm not black, I'm O.J., and he didn't exactly do anything for the black community in Los Angeles. But thus, a movement was born, and we see it every day. We see it on college campuses, we see it in the media, um, and we're seeing it right now. We're seeing the, the, the main mechanism of social justice, virtue signaling and affirmative action, play out right now at NBC. So at NBC, if you've been following anything from the Ronan Farrow book that came out, as it turns out, they covered up Ronan Farrow's reporting into Harvey Weinstein because they didn't want Weinstein to expose the fact that Matt Lauer had been allowed to sexually abuse his own staff for years, decades maybe. And you know now there's uproar in the network. You have Chris Hayes, Rachel Maddow, prominent figures calling out their bosses at NBC Universal and at NBC News saying, why does Andy Lack still have a job? Why does, and their solution is not to fire Andy Lack. It's not to fire Noah Oppenheim. Instead, they are just going to make all four of the debate moderators for the MSNBC presidential debate next month women. Voila, justice, yes. And that is the main mechanism of how social justice uses virtue signaling to ignore actual individual justice. I, I think that's a great point, Dana. So, Robert, there have been some injustices thrown out on, on the table yeah. here. Um, and I, I'll throw in, uh, we have the bailouts. You, you and I believe in free enterprise, and you have to have well, a profit and loss system, and people have to fail. You have bailouts, you have corporate welfare. Um, d don't we kind of have a rigged well, game? No, I don't think so. I, I, I really don't. And I think that the failure to retain our confidence in our institutions is a real problem in the United States. And so I do think the rhetoric uh, of, of the kind that we're talking about, rigged society, unjust, angry, um, can do real damage. Uh, you know, in, in New York City, I worked for an administration that changed the policing practices in the city and really made us a much stronger, better city. Mayor Giuliani did a great job then. And I'm proud of that. And the, the rhetoric about our unjust society came, came alive in later years and really, un, really questioned the underlying ability of the criminal justice system in the city of New York, police officers, judges, people in the corrections institutions, and have destroyed the confidence Americans have in them when the fact is they really did an outstanding job. People who were arrested and went to, to uh, be before the judges in New York City and went to jail, went to jail because they committed a crime. And so I, I, I just, you know, we're not perfect. Mistakes happen, but when the rhetoric gets to the point where we're challenging, in a way, for instance, Judge Starr would never do, challenging the underlying justice system of our country, the institutions that we rely on, the judges, police officers, I think we, we make a mistake, and I think we send the wrong message to Americans. But, I mean, I'm from New York. I rooted for Rudy and the police, but um, the Amadou Diallo case happened. Um, and then recently, what we get is this, a story every month of, you know, there's an unarmed kid shot in the back while running story away. Story every month is not, is not, is not there, are all, there are mistakes, but, you know, anecdotes do not make data. And you have to be careful when you make a, you know, a this or that into the controlling story about the strength of our country. We really do have an issue in the country about whether we believe in America anymore. And I don't think that the rhetoric about how awful America is is only bad on the left. I think sometimes it's bad on the other side too. And that's what, uh, uh, you know, that's what I'm talking about. So the, um I guess now the economics, um, again, Trump and Bernie both 
did so well in 2016, I think because of a perception of something being rigged. That Donald Trump said, the other countries are smart, we are dumb, they are fighting for themselves, and they are stealing our jobs. And at the same time, some people in the banking industry are getting rich from the free trade. And Bernie Sanders is basically saying capitalism itself is totally un unjust. So if, if you got a, a Trump populist who didn't like uh, free trade, or if you got a Bernie voter who said, actually, Mr. Dora, I'm interested in your ideas at the American Enterprise Institute, um, but isn't capitalism inherently unjust if we have inequality, if we have, uh, in some places, a lack of economic mobility, if we have CEOs making however many thousands times the lower down, uh, what would your counter argument to those people well, be? Well, people vote for Donald Trump for lots of reasons. I happen to think that one of the reasons they voted for Donald Trump is because he wasn't Hillary Clinton. <laughs> yes. And that's not the same as saying I voted for Donald Trump because I buy everything he says about the rigged nature of American society. Um, Bernie Sanders may have gotten a lot of votes and there may have been some feeling about uh, you know, inequality and there are definitely people in America that have socialist views, we know that. But I don't think either one of those political excavates reveals that, the, that what they're saying is true or even that most Americans think it. There are lots of reasons why people vote uh, an election and President Trump's greatest advantage in the last election, I think Karl Rove kind of indicated in the previous conversation, was his opponent. And um, it wasn't, you know, everybody who voted for him didn't buy every aspect of his rhetoric or every aspect of his anger. Um, in some respects, it might have been a vote to protect the institutions that we have come to like and respect. I mean, there's a lot of concern in the country now about the damage to our constitutional system that the far left of the Democratic Party wants to do. Mm -hmm. And we need to rally that by expressing confidence in the underlying justice of our society. Can we examine the premise, though, of economic justice? Because since when does economic justice mean that everybody's uh, equal effort will get the same outcome? Right? As I, I, I've heard it said, I was told I get a college degree, I, I uh, play by the rules, and I work hard, and I'll be fine, and I'll be set for life. Who the hell told you that? No, you play by the rules, and by the way, the college education is a whole other conversation, but you play by the rules and you work hard, and yeah, you have the chance to get ahead, you even have the chance to get rich, but guess what? You also have the chance to lose a job, it happens. There is no guarantee here, there is no, everyone puts in the same work and everyone's gonna get the same income. That's not justice, that's socialism. So, so I, I reject the idea that economic justice means everyone gets treated the same. Uh, I, I think we need to re-examine how we discuss those things. By the way, there is a presidential candidate who has made it part of their platform right now that uh, we need to put more money into trade school education after high school because college is not right for everyone and not everybody should get a liberal arts degree, let alone once they have it, will they actually be a benefit to our society. I'm elaborating on their policy, but, but they're saying let's spend more money on trades Let's make sure that we have policies in America where the American people benefit from the research and development that our companies do, partially supported by the government and our tax dollars, uh, and actually talks about, you know, the president is not against free trade. The president is against trade policies where we end up on the short end of the stick, and it's called free trade. And sadly, that did happen in many of these instances. By the way, the candidate that articulated those three things, Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren has put that out there. That, that is going to resonate with people because it transcends sort of the typical party line thing. It's common sense. So th there is an issue there, but we need to re-examine how we actually expect our economy to work, whether it's really about all this e you put in or you get out what you put in. Tiana. I do feel the need to add that Andrew Yang has also made a subsidizing trade schools part of his platform. Um, and free money. <laughs> yeah. Hey, universal basic income, Milton Friedman liked it. Um, with regards to the idea of the American promise, it was never when my grandparents came, when our ancestors came. The American promise was not that you get, that you get here, you get to own a home, you get to have 
you know, however much wealth you want. The American promise was the opportunity for you to earn that on merit. And I think that in our, the way that we sort of tried to pathologize childhood development and create this pipeline that everyone's supposed to follow, it's, it has created this college cartel that the federal government is funding. They are subsidizing these schools so these university bureaucrats can jack up prices while doubling the amount of bureaucrats on campus and keeping the number of professors and academic resources exactly the same, inflating the cost of our degrees. And then we tell every single kid in America that if they don't go to a four-year institution, that their hopes of achieving the so-called American dream is nil. And in a way, I think the impulse behind at least the Bernie base, nothing exemplified it more than when that whole college admissions uh, fraud scandal came out months back. I think a lot of us who had just graduated college, a lot of us who had spent all of high school doing every extracurricular under the sun, our parents paid for us to have SAT tutors, we just shelled out an exorbitant amount on a degree. I think we were all just kind of thinking, oh, that's, it's illegal? We know so many people who bribed their ways into top schools. Oh, but they just did it the illegal way. They didn't just donate a building. They didn't just donate a library. So yes, the system is to an extent rigged. I mean, if you look up the makeup of presidents and Supreme Court justices and CEOs and look at what schools they come from, there is a pipeline. I mean, well, in but the prior question to that would be, is the admission to those schools fair and just. In other words, uh, my dad was able to come from a working class family, go to Hofstra, get into Harvard Law. He did not pass his uh, IQ down to all his children. So I, um, so only only my only the smart brother got into an Ivy League school. But that was fair because he was smarter. But the point is, if you uh, you're pointing out, if you are able to uh, pay for SAT prep, if you are if you go to if you're able to afford a house to live in a great public school district, you. Both of those things give you a better chance of getting you into Yale Law, which gives you a better chance of landing on the Supreme Court. Robert. So I want to just reiterate a little bit something that Larry said that is important and I think is what corrupts our perception of what we want our country to be. And that is the misinterpretation of the, uh, of the, of the goal of equality. People have uh, perceived the media, because of the media and because of the message and because of the way people are learning things in schools, they've perceived that the goal of the civil rights movement, for instance, and the achievement of the civil rights movement was intended to be equal outcomes for everyone, equally represented in the population in various places in their, in their result based on race. And that was never the promise. It was never in the deal. It was equal opportunity, it was an equal chance. But outcomes are different, and they are going to be different based on competition, and merit, and work, and effort, and luck, and there may be certain advantages that are on the scale, but we never promised equal outcomes for all Americans. And if people get it in their head that that's what it's supposed to be, then of course they're going to say the, the country's unjust. But that starts with the wrong premise. And we, as conservatives, need to fight against that. Because if you get it in your head that everybody's got to fall out of all the things that happen in their life, their college outcomes, where they get jobs, based on equal representative representation by race or by sex, then you're gonna be going down a completely wrong path. And we have to fight that. So one idea of uh, justice, and uh, Robert, you and I are, are Catholics, um, and so the, the word social justice, so the, the word social justice Probably, was, yeah. not, was not <laughs> invented by, um, you know, by ta Coates or by the New York Times editorial page. It's, there's right. Catholic teachings on social justice. And barring, I mentioned Plato earlier, not Pluto, Larry, Plato, um, and he said, uh, at like, giving people what they deserve is pretty close to the idea of justice. And we're articulating here an idea that for the most part, that means giving people an equal opportunity to compete. This is why we fight for free enterprise. You want it as open a playing field as possible and we have the most uh, free one. Um, for the poor, what do we owe them and are we giving it to them? And I'm starting with you, Robert, because this was your job in right. New York City. So tell people what you did. So the, the, what I think we owe them is an opportunity uh, to get into work and not an invitation 
to rely on government to take care of their needs for the rest of their lives. But it takes so work I, to give I, them that I, opportunity. Well, let me just say, I, I strongly object to the movement of the American government to sort of create a society where every where many people are wards of the state, from cradle to grave. That is not what we owe them, but that is what people think we owe them, and that's a mistake. Um, what we in New York said was, if you are in need and seek help, and this wasn't just in New York, but in other places as well, we will help you, but you need to do something too. You need to show some effort or responsibility. I am the biggest supporter and proponent and implementer of work requirements in public assistance uh, programs in the country. And that's because I treat people as if they have potential, as if they are assets, not liabilities, as if they can do what I know they can do, which is make an effort. And so I think that's what we owe people in public. I don't, I don't object to programs that provide assistance to Americans, certainly people that are disabled need particular assistance, but I, I object to programs that offer them assistance without responsibilities. So I think we owe them aid, but also a, 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 a deal. It's a reciprocal responsibility between the provider of assistance and the receiver of assistance. Which, by the way, uh, yeah, right? Yeah. But that also has the added benefit of, of being justice yeah. for those of us who are not in need of government assistance because when we see people receiving government assistance right. and we're working our tail off every day to, oh, by the way, fund that government assistance, if they are not asked to do at least a modicum of something, even to show an effort, hey, okay, you're homeless, you're living on the street, you want assistance, we're gonna give you a job. Clean up the street that you just messed up, you know? Right. That's, that's a sense of justice for all of us. Justice, social justice is not just how you help the people who are downtrodden. And you raise Catholicism. It is very interesting that uh, many people, I see many, I see Joe Biden, I see Nancy Pelosi, I see John Kerry, I see many Catholic Democrats utilize their religion. Pete Buttigieg is not a Catholic, but have you ever seen a candidate scream about Jesus and, and the Bible to rationalize his position? What? Pete Buttigieg does it more than, than, than Pat Robertson did when he <laughs> ran for office. And they always inject their faith to support their specific agenda. And it's always a, a big government welfare program and say, well, I'm Christian and my church instructs me that this is what I'm supposed to do. A excuse me. Let's, if we're going to do that, can we just bring the entire catechism over? <laughs> yeah. Can we bring the entire canon over and say, okay, well, it's true. Uh, we're supposed to do that, but oh, you know what else? We're not supposed to kill babies when they're in the womb. How <laughs> yes. about how about we do that as well? Um, or for that matter, self-select abortions of children who are diagnosed with Down syndrome, as we have very smart columnists now uh, purporting to do. I believe she is also Catholic, right, Sally Quinn? Yeah. Uh, uh, who wrote that column? So uh, when you raise Catholicism, I get very very hesitant about that because, frankly, I yes, my faith certainly uh, instructs my views and, and it and instructs my vote in many cases, but uh, in the things that I think the government has a proper role in doing and, and, not, and, not, and not everything else. Tiana. Thank you. Thank you there very There you much. go. There you go. So as a matter of the government, I think that they owe the poor liberty and equal rights and justice under the law. But owing the poor is different than focusing on the society's well-being as a whole. And in that respect, I guess there are two interests at hand. One, harm minimization, because we obviously care about the preservation of life. And then also decreasing negative externalities. If we look at the idea of in, in, a, in a place like California, especially in San Francisco and Los Angeles, where the government has completely abdicated any role in handling the homeless crisis, which is in large part due to substance abuse and uh, veterans and mental illness, the externalities are now piling up. You're having medieval diseases make a comeback. It's becoming a huge tax burden on taxpayers. It's now, it is affecting everyone. It is affecting the wealthy. It is affecting the job creators. Because the city didn't think about the return on investment of nipping the homelessness problem in the bud. And so in that respect, it is good for us to treat people like they have potential, invest in them so that way then they can help themselves. They can help themselves. And then it's not a handout. It's not a handout to the reason why we accept that public school is not a handout is because, at least on paper, it's supposed to be something that we all invest in. 
and that grows our economy and benefits everyone. Does that happen in practice? No, because we have a union cartel that controls all the schools. But the point is that if we treat people like they have potential and if we focus on the return on our investment in humanity, then I don't think we even need to focus on the moral obligation at all because it's a purely pragmatic one. So, but underneath this, I'm just, this, Robert, you're not making a purely sort of libertarian idea. Like, I remember if you asked me when I was 21, I would say the New Deal and the Great Society need to be repealed. <laughs> but then you wouldn't have had a job in New York <laughs> for, for Bloomberg. I mean, so does a government uh, have a, a role? Does the government have a duty, um, local, state, whatever, to provide some of this safety net at yeah, all? I'm, I'm not a libertarian. That's right, Tim. I'm not. And there's a long tradition at the American Enterprise Institute of non-libertarians <laughs> believing in the, the government has a role in, in these various issues. Um, I, I want to address the homeless issue because, to me, I have a little bit of experience there. You are not helping the poor if you're ignoring their behavior in the streets of the cities of America. You have to... Uh, partner with the police department to reach out to them and say, not reach out, to say to them, this is not going to be allowed. That is the way, that's actually more compassionate than ignoring it. So I, I completely agree with, uh, and, but by the way, Tim, you're gonna have to do that with a governmental agency. And the libertarians aren't necessarily gonna do it. Libertarians actually may be contributing to our desire to sort of ignore it. So I, I definitely think government has a role and I wanted to address the, the role of government with regard to homelessness because it is, really becoming a, a tragedy in, in American cities. But the, the only, the, it can't just be that they have to arrest the guy Not who's arrest, move them along, move them to the next step, move, move on. This is not, and then look for them to rely on their own selves and their own families to, to find, that's what's happened here, is we've decided to act like there's no other role for them or for mm -hmm. their families, and we can't do that. And I think, I think a hyper-individualism is behind that, which is to say, who am I to tell them how to live? Yeah. And that that's a, an abdication that's that's unjust to. Uh, well, we have no right to tell them how to live up until the point that their choice of how they live affects the rest of us, right. and becomes a, well, it's true, and it becomes a burden. You can live however you want, but when you're sleeping at forget about sleeping, living on my sidewalk in front of my business for weeks and weeks and weeks without bathing and without toilet facilities, that affects not just me, it affects our entire community, it affects our children, and therefore we have not only a right but an obligation to tell them what to do. And, and yes, the Giuliani administration, absolutely, it, it was the perfect model and how California doesn't, well, I know why California doesn't uh, follow it, is the bottom line. The number one, you start from the premise is you do not have a right to live on our streets, number one. We all must agree on that. Sadly, there are people who will not agree to that. There are, there are social justice warriors who believe if someone, they should have a right to live on the street, it's just as much theirs as ours, right? Uh, number one, you don't have a right to live on the street. Now, let's take it from there. Number two, do you want help? Do you want, uh, we'll give you a place to sleep, we'll clean you up, we'll even give you a new pair of set of clothes they did in the Giuliani administration. They dressed them, they gave them job training, and they helped them get work. Now. If that's not where they are and there is substance abuse, then we're going to get you substance abuse. But you got to stick to it. There are rules and obligations, as you right. said, Robert. No, that's and right. And, and I'm just and glad on. you're emphasizing both both sides of, yeah. of the yeah. of the duty. That um, and that is justice. So, <coughs> I, I want to get back to economics a little. Um, who knows the name Adam Newman? Uh, you know the name Adam. You guys do. Adam Newman was the CEO of a company called WeWork. Um, WeWork has a very strange business model where instead of you going to working from home or working from a coffee shop, they want you to pay thousands of dollars a month to like have a, a desk in some subletted office space and uh, the company is just collapsing. And the firm that took over WeWork paid him out $1.7 billion to get him out of this company that he was destroying. And meanwhile, thousands of the people who work for the company were laid off because they were cash strapped. So this is not a glowing endorsement of capitalism. And I think it's a sort of example that's behind why a lot of people uh, think we have a, a terribly unfair system. Candidates used to not be willing to say the capitalist system doesn't work. Democratic candidates are going out there saying it because they know that it doesn't sound crazy, that it makes sense to a lot of people out there listening. So uh, starting with you, Tiana, what's your, what's your reaction on that? 
So at the beginning of the year, uh, we work was tentatively valued around $80 billion, uh, and now it's been decimated to $8 billion. WeWork's business model is something that's been done for, you know, decades. The idea of a big company will take up long-term leases and then splice them up for startups, and it makes sense. But it was in large part the sycophancy of the financial media Did allowing- Did you just say sycophancy is sycophancy? Yeah, this is how you know that a person was really a good reader as a kid, is they, they learned all these wor big words, because Tiana was reading like giant books when she was 12, she told me. So she, you learn all these big words and you mispronounce them. So Sorry, I didn't want to embarrass you on that. But it's always impressed me how well I, I read. I didn't want to embarrass yes. you, he said. How, yeah, how well read. That was Tim. Tim, you're not moderating the next AEI conference. <laughs> I just like the way you said fancy. It's very, very Orange County. <laughs> Sorry, Tina, go no, ahead. No, 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 it's all good. You're the, you're the best boss, Tim. <laughs> um, <laughs> See, Robert doesn't do that sort of thing to me. <laughs> so the tech media decided that WeWork was a tech company despite WeWork not making any innovation. And so what happens? You have a bunch of private investors overinflate the value of the company. They allow Adam Newman to sign an insane contract where he sells them the brand, the We Company, and makes the company pay him for a name that the company invented. And now people are shocked that it's crumbling, the fact that you're taking a concept that is decades old and acting like it's the next Uber, like the next Tesla. There was no technological innovation. It was just big, and it acted like it was progressive, and it acted like it was woke, and they gave you kombucha on tap. And they so outlawed meat. They outlawed meat in the company event, so that was like, it's got to be a great company if they're vegetarian. Yeah, and so, I mean, there are obviously a number of factors, including outside investment, SoftBank, the company that's taking over, uh, that's a Japanese uh, firm. But to the point, to your initial point about corporate bailouts, those have to end. We have to let billionaires bite the dust if they sell a junk product. Because that's the only way that we're going to prevent these so-called wonderkin CEOs from screwing over all these employees that they know that they're, I mean, this is a big deal in media back in the day when all these companies decided they were going to pivot to Facebook, think progress, or to pivot to video on Facebook, think progress, pivoted to video, it just crumbled. Now this, pivoted, a company I used to work for, they pivoted to video, they all collapsed, and then you have all these 20-something year olds saying, wow, capitalism sucks. They, they get these investors that pay these CEOs out, and then we all get fired after their bad business idea flames out. And so there, there has to be, there does have to be sort of a, a, a sense of conscience that these investors have. There can't be the hope that, that these corporations will always just be bailed out. And to that point, I think that further, that did fuel Trump's rise. That did fuel Bernie's rise. And that populism is not going away if things don't change. Uh, I would just say uh, I don't like you know what the, these people do or that they waste a lot of money or they run their companies badly and hurt their shareholders and hurt their employees. I don't really like any of that. I won't get into the details of that. But I also am very skeptical of efforts on the government part to sort of control it all in a desire to make everything fair. Um, I'm one of my favorite uh, remarks, and I don't think any presidential candidate on the Democratic side, or maybe even on the Republican side, would be able to say this anymore of a president at a press conference, was when President Kennedy bluntly said, I got news for you, life is unfair. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a fact. And I think this idea that we have to make everything perfect, and everything smooth, and everything easy, and there are no victims, is what's corrupting our society. And this, But it comes in the same rhetoric when we rail against, you know, bad things that happen in, in capitalism. We, yeah. we think, it, well, it, that's bad, so we should fix it. And yeah. I just think that would cause more damage than benefit. Uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, I think we conservatives went astray a little bit a, a couple of decades ago by mixing up being pro-free market with being pro-big business, because they ain't the same thing. You talk to any CEO of a big company, they hate the free market. They want to dominate. They want 100% market share. They don't want a free market. They want all of it, right? So being pro-big, and I'm not anti-big business, I'm just being real. So be, we need to be pro-free market. If that means some businesses succeed, great. It also means, by definition, that some businesses will fail. When you say, Tim, that we've got candidates who are now saying uh, capitalism doesn't work, and they're saying it because they know it makes sense, 
They're saying it because they know that a vast majority of the people who are listening to it, frankly, have no sense of history, have no basic understanding of economics, and so they're going to lap it up because they don't know otherwise. They should be more responsible and say, you know what, what happened at WeWorks is obscene. It's outrageous. And this guy walks off with a billion, and meanwhile, you know, people are laid off. But guess what? Those people who were laid off, they got a liberal arts degree. They probably can't do a whole lot anyway. They were making 70 grand a year for five years, and now they need to find another job. We survived the robber barons of the industrial age. We survived people dying on the assembly line uh, uh, and or dying in sweatshops. Uh, I'm not saying those were good things. What I'm saying is capitalism has, in America has been a lot worse than it is right now. And with some historical context, maybe we can say, okay, it's not capitalism that's bad. It's just that there's some things that have been a really bad practices of capitalism, but not the whole damn thing. Um, Tiana. And in small part, uh, this isn't a, a call to government action so much as it is the power of social media is that now we can remember and reclaim the idea that in a capitalist economy, we aren't agentless pawns of big business. We are consumers who have the ability to voice our choices and the reasons why we make them. It's why I believe that something like the government doesn't need to step in with the NBA. I say, why don't we boycott the NBA until they stop bending the knee to China? With companies like WeWork, it's a little bit more different because you're dealing with a series of strange investments. But that was one where years ago, again, with the whole collapse of a lot of digital media, I kept on telling people, stop giving these outlets clicks because you're fueling the rise of investment. And you know, I, I, I think that conservatives are right to be weary of boycott culture. You shouldn't boycott Chick-fil-A because one guy who owns it has personal feelings about traditional marriage. But it's totally wise and good, I think, to hold companies to account based on their corporate governance and their corporate policies. And if their corporate policies are unfair and screwing over the little guy, capitalism means that us as consumers have the power to withhold our dollars from them. And so you're sort of pushing back on, on Robert here a little, who's worried that, um, <laughs> who sees, you see demagogues making people decide the system's unjust, and you see then people are gonna give up on even trying because they think it's too rigged, or they're gonna turn to socialism, I agree. Uh, the other three of us up here are, are journalists, and it's our jobs to say, and we're, we're opinion journalists, and uh, there's a joke on our desk at the Washington Examiner, one of my ed deputy editors says, half of our pieces boil down to saying, that person should not have done that thing. <laughs> Um, and it's it's exactly right. That that person, D Donald Trump, should not have made that uh, tweet. Matt Lauer should not have had that button on his desk, etc. Um, but so us, a lot of times, we we need to point out the injustice, point out the that the policeman did something wrong when he shot somebody in the back. We need to point out that um, actually the complexity of the tax code is a subsidy to whoever can afford the lobbyists, and that's. That's unjust. So there are unjust things about our society. Shouldn't we be calling those well, out? I don't. I didn't say that there wasn't. There weren't aspects, uh, examples of, of lack of justice. I didn't say everything was perfect. I just the the starting question was: Do we live in an unjust society? And I am motivated by wanting to speak strongly about that because I really do think this feeling that we live in an unjust society is doing damage to our country. We've lost confidence in our institutions, and and I blame lots of people for it. But we've got to bring them back because if we don't, we're going to lose our country. But the, I guess the underlying question is, haven't some of these institutions deserved to lose some of the confidence? So bring it back to our I church. Think some cases our church has definitely, the Catholic Church has definitely done and failed to do things. And, and the so worst have, thing in the we world. We have to rebuild. We have to rebuild. We have to restart. We, I get that, that, you know, I don't just deny that that's a good example of an area that, uh, that change and, and rethinking and, and rebuilding needs to take place. But it doesn't undermine the underlying faith in the in the institution. Right, and, and faith is the right word in this case <laughs> in particular. Yeah, right. Yes, there are reforms that are needed in the uh, Catholic Church, especially the American Catholic Church. But that doesn't change whether we believe that Jesus Christ is the incarnate Son of God who died for our sins. And that's what we're hearing from candidates and social justice warriors. Is yet yeah, they point out all of these failures and say, and that's why we got to burn it all down. Yeah. And we have to get rid of it. And by the way, 
let's just be real here, and we need to be better at articulating these arguments. Who are the ones who are pushing social justice and talking about income inequality and income disparity for the Democrats right now? Elizabeth Warren, who, by the way, made a ton of money pretending she was a minority. <laughs> All right, where's the justice there? Bernie Sanders, who owns three homes right now, but resisted his own campaign staffers from organizing a union so they could get basic minimum wage. And they're screaming at us about our injustices and our inequality. Get up your own damn house first. <laughs> Thank you. But at the same time, it is possible to understand that the intention and the core principles and the purpose of our institutions are vital and necessary and still see the execution somewhere along the way broke down. If you take the Catholic Church, I don't think that it's any dig at the meaning of the church and at the text of the church to understand, yeah, mistakes were made. Something like the media, I mean, the fourth estate is foundational to living in a free democracy. It's a necessary check on power, and yet we know that the media, as it currently is, broke down long ago, and hopefully we can try and repair it because we want a media, and it's not the same thing as saying we shouldn't have a media to note that the media is behaving improperly right now. Yeah, well, and we should burn the media down. <laughs> Don't get must, me wrong. But then we ought to rebuild no, no. it. I was kind of yeah, curious then, about how you, what your view was on that. Except for the Washington Examiner. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, no, and I, I th it's actually an interesting thing that we talk about justice in the media because I think that there's this b horrible word that gets used about the media, which is objective, that we're supposed to tell the story objectively. That's an impossible thing. No person can describe the object in itself, we can describe an object that we perceive, and you should try to see it from every angle and ask some questions of it and ask other people about it. And at the end, what we gotta try to produce is a story that's fair and that's just is another word to do it. And I don't think that, I think that the, the notion of what's fair and just goes to the sort of reparation idea that you were talking about early. Well, the fair thing to do here is a makeup call for slavery. The fair thing to do in this case is a makeup call for Jim Crow. And I think that the media is very explicit that they're gonna be uh, harsher on the police to sort of get back at, at something else they saw. So that's this, this sort of cross temporal idea of justice. Is there stuff we have to m do to make Did up? Did you just pronounce it temporal instead of temporal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's interesting, isn't it? It's very Tiana, rude. do you want to very comment rude on this? to or? comment on the pronunciation of your <laughs> co-panels. Um, so is, is there any idea that we need to make up for it, um, or not make up for it, but that because of slavery and because of uh, Jim Crow, that just it's a lot harder if you're uh, a black guy to, I mean, you're growing up in a community that's, that's less strong. So isn't there something to be said that the sins of the past still do have to be made up for? I certainly think... In some cases, yes. For instance, as a matter of principle, the notion of reparations isn't immoral. The question being, how on earth do you execute it? In the sense of, so reparations would be designed to correct the historical injustice of slavery and Jim Crow. Does this mean that a Nigerian American whose family has been in the country for under 15 years, do they deserve reparations? Do I have to pay out reparations even though my family immigrated here half a century ago and had no part of the Jim Crow process. So where conservatives go wrong is by writing off the idea that we did never atone for that past. We fought a civil war and then we completely botched reconstruction. But noting that, that reparations have a good purpose, or a, as a good paradigm of how we should think about correcting slavery, and to your point, the idea of these communities being less strong, these families being less strong because of historical practices like redlining, and because of the criminal justice system, calling out that reparations have a good purpose does not mean that we need to buy into the Elizabeth Warren idea that every single American owes 40 acres and a mule to their black neighbor. That's, because that's a question of practicality. But no, conservatives should not be so blase about the fact that the legacy of Jim Crow is very recent. Okay, but social justice warriors shouldn't just gloss over the fact, I mean, yes, we fought a civil war. Let's pause on that for a moment. It was the bloodiest, most murderous war in American history. 
And when I talk about reparations on my radio show in Washington, D.C., I hear from families in Northern Virginia who live next to a cemetery of young American white boys who died in the battlefield for, for the abolition of slavery. And I think that that sacrifice and that reparation to end slavery does not get the credit that it deserves. It wasn't just a war. People were will little young men from Michigan who had nothing to do with slavery were willing to, in Ohio, were willing to come down and fight in Georgia and Virginia and Maryland and lose their lives for an anonymous black slave. And they, and they did it willingly because they believed in a higher ideal. That's a hell of a thing. And by the way, okay, by the way, no, things are not obviously uh, perfect and equal and just for every single black person in America. Neither is it for every white or Asian or Latino person in America. But guess what? I would say that probably black people in America have a more just society to live in than pretty much any other place on the planet, including African nations. So yeah. what? Yeah. Yeah. It, I, and, and again, and this comes back to justice is different from the perception of equality. Of, of, of equality. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and what might be a justice solution in reparations from the eyes of other people who are looking at it and saying, well, that's not just at all because now you're taking from me to give to that person because of something that happened to their ancestor 150 years ago. So I'm with Justice Roberts when he wrote the way to end race-based discrimination in the United States is to end race-based discrimination in the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, and my my view, and I, you know, there, there's some personal history in this, the, the civil rights movement was a great achievement, but we have, we have really got a, uh, uh, we are doing a disservice to Americans when we obsess so much on race. It, it, is, it is not the principal barrier to upward mobility in the United States. The principal barrier to upward mobility in the United States, in my judgment, is the extent to which we raise children in single parent families. And that's a problem of whites and Hispanics and blacks too. And that's a much bigger problem. And, and by, by making it always, as the left does, always about race, and discrimination and bigotry and all this, which I just don't, I, in an official capacity, I think is much less present, much, much less present in the United States. Um, they, are, they are sending a damaging message to African-American children in the United States who then believe that that's the problem when it's not other factors that they can do something about. And, and by the way, it seems like every solution for the, the broad justice or inequality or unfairness issue that is before us, where, you know, we're, we're going to end race-based, or no, we're going to start affirmative action in colleges because in the past people have been discriminated against because of their race. Great idea, sounds wonderful, makes everybody feel good. Now, what's the outcome of that? Individuals will be discriminated against because of their race. You had this broad societal solution to a problem, but individuals will now get their own injustice. My daughter is mixed race. She is half Asian. She is currently at the United States Naval Academy. She was accepted there, thank God. She also got, thank you. you. Go. She also got early acceptance to MIT. This is a smart kid, right? She's uh, okay. Not she, like her dad. Not like her dad at all. <laughs> she got, I'm the only one up here without a college degree. But <laughs> she got waitlisted. She got accepted to MIT early. She got accepted to the Naval Academy. She got waitlisted at a public California school because she's Asian. Be not because there are too many Asians because they have quotas, right? Yeah. No, right. I mean, I, I was told don't add to my college application that I have any Asian ethnicity. That's right. Yes, and if I, you click the Asian box, you will be discriminated against because you're too good. So um, I'm going to give you guys final uh, final words um, in a second, but I'm my my view on some of this, and again, thinking about this as. Um, somebody who studies the, the state of the country, somebody who writes about it. I think one, the mistake the left makes is they see a problem and they want a government solution. I think the mistake the right makes is they see a pro proposed government solution and so sometimes we deny the problem. And so that's just because, you know, we don't, there's no federal fix to the WeWork thing, is, should, I don't think should stop us from saying, 
this is absolutely unfair and unjust. So that's that's yeah. my take there. And I would implore conservatives out there to, when the left has a horrible solution, to not take the step to deny the problem, but to just explain it the way that, that Tiena explained on, on the reparations, et cetera. So anyway, uh, any final words on the, the, the justice of America, starting with you, Tiena? So t to your point about the idea of identifying the problem, sometimes admitting that an injustice exists, even if it cannot be rectified by any government intervention, by any widespread mechanism, sometimes admitting it exists, that catharsis alone is an administration of justice. Maybe there, there probably is no solution to actually make up for the past of slavery or of Jim Crow laws. But if we admit that we need to focus on black communities, we need to focus on black parenthood, we need to invest in black schools, then that is a part of the path of correcting that injustice. As we saw with the whole Me Too movement, the solution was not to abandon due process, to vilify men, to ignore evidence, but it was to start listening more and allow people with a claim to be heard, voice their evidence, and make a deliberation. That wasn't a change in, in any proposition of law, and it shouldn't be this reactionary Obama-era abandonment of due process, as we saw. But it is about letting the problem be heard, admitting that it exists. And in that name, I don't think that we are, I don't think that our progress on justice is getting worse. I think it's getting better. The more empowered people feel to speak out about that which they feel aggrieved. Thank you. I, I would not necessarily disagree with you at all. In fact, uh, and, and I think the, the key takeaway here for us is uh, we should take a backseat to no one on compassion for people who are being uh, dealt with in an unjust way. Uh, I think that the left steals the idea of compassion because their only solution is a big government solution, a big government, all controlling solution that will make matters worse. That's just the bottom line because that's always what happens. There never is a big government solution except for winning a war. That, that's a big government solution that makes things better. Uh, but, but we should not roll our eyes when people are asking for compassion. My God, look at the numbers. Uh, who, who donates the most to charity to help people? Conservatives do. Faith-based conservatives do. Uh, where, where are the most donations and the most effort put forth to help people who are in dire straits? In, in conservative states. I don't say red states because uh, the communists are red and those are Democrats. Uh, but in conservative states, we are compassionate. We just actually want to help people, not build the government. There's a difference, and we should never shy away from the fact that we are the most compassionate. The difference is we want to actually make it better, and we can make it better in our neighborhoods, in our homes, not on Capitol Hill. And, and my point would be is that we are, that a lot of that is happening. That, that Tim, you are a little bit too skeptical about the extent to which when people see a problem, all they do is complain about the problem and don't actually try to solve it. I think there's a lot of issue by issue. A lot, we are a cacophony of a country. It's amazing all the things that are going on. But what's also going on is this bipartisan, mo mostly from the left, but there's a little bit on the right as well, uh, undermining of our confidence in, in our underlying institutions, and that's damaging. Thank you guys very much. Thanks, Tim. Thank you all as well.